Appreciate you being here tonight. Next Wednesday, we will begin the experiment. So we'll be having a service at 5.30 that will last till about 6.15, 6.20. Those who desire to eat at Wednesday Fest will then, after services, be able to go and to have Wednesday Fest. Then at 7 o'clock, uh, each one of the elders will be leading a small group, as has been announced. The study is going to be on evangelism, and uh, so if you are interested in the 7 o'clock, they would like to try to balance the groups, and by, to do that, we're asking that you might sign up. Uh, that way, if you want to be in a group with a friend or friends, you are certainly welcome to do that as far as possible. So the sign-up sheets are available and uh, you can do that uh, tonight or Sunday as we get ready for uh, that following Wednesday evening, the first Wednesday evening in March. Second thing of uh, announcement and, and appeal, uh, Brother Garo called me uh, several days ago and he was talking about uh, Brother Enrique Morales, who is uh, working with uh, the Spanish congregation that meets in this building. He presently is a student at Brown Trail in the Spanish program, and uh, his car is uh, getting close to its uh, last breaths. And uh, of course, as a college student or in, a, uh, uh, in the school of preaching, he, he doesn't have a whole lot of funds uh, to take care of he and his wife, and I believe they have three children. Uh, if you know of a, a car that someone could uh, part with uh, very inexpensively, or a car that you say, hey, I was going to give this to the Can Academy, I believe I'll just give this to a preacher brother that would give him a little bit more dependable transportation, why uh, that would be appreciated. Uh, give your name to me or um, Brother Garo if you should see him or want to call him, and uh, we'll do our best to take care uh, of that situation. It's probably been 30 years ago that I first came across a person describing Christians as donkeys. And it was in a very, very negative context. Uh, he said the wrong problem with most people in Christianity that he knew is that they were born in the kickative mood. And if you've been around donkeys any at all, you know that they have a tendency to tell you that they are there by lifting one hind leg and propelling it backward with great force. Uh, I have a good friend in New Mexico that uh, has right in the center of his chest a hoof print to this day uh, because the donkey decided to give him that uh, greeting. And the other complaint that people would have along this line would be, uh, you know, Christians are just so long-faced, just like a donkey. And um, they don't smile, they aren't happy, they aren't joyous about their relationship with Christ. It's just kind of a sad situation. Now, if I were to stop right there, I'm going to guess that most of us would say, Robert, I really don't know why you're saying I want to be a Christian donkey. But there is another dynamic to this little, little furry friend, this, this burrow, that we need to stop and contemplate. Uh, I guess I began to think about it because a lot of people have had pet donkeys and they're beginning to let them out on the byways and highways and, and they're having to be destroyed by various and sundry people. But there was a time in which a donkey was one of the most valuable possessions that a person especially who was not familiar or did not have horses, uh, would have. And a donkey would be a great possession because a donkey was a beast of burden. When I was a young man, we used to hunt deer on horseback a lot, and every now and then we would want to go back into 
some area that uh, would take you way too long to just go and come in a day. And so we'd take a camping supply kit with us and usually it would be some sort of beast of burden like this. Always, always amazed me how much weight you could put on the back of, of a donkey. And as you put that weight on the back of the donkey, it might uh, groan a little bit, but it would bear up under the burden and it would travel behind those horses. And one I remember particularly that we had uh, access to, we never did have to put a lead rope on him. You just said, come on. And he followed the horses just very, very patiently, very steadily. Beast of burden. A beast that was so long-winded and enduring that it could just go and go and go with a very heavy pack on its back and would just keep on going. Well, I, I heard the pages of some Bibles rustling a few moments ago. You were opening up to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2, and so you've already discovered what direction we're going possibly tonight with this. Very simple little verse, is it not? Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. It's going to be just a little while before we get to that. It's going to be a little while before I talk about us being Christian donkeys. But I want us to, to, to spend a little time thinking about the dynamic that's involved here because just as we talked about stress last week, one of the great issues that I see in, in life in general, and I have always seen it in life, is that individuals have great burdens to carry. Uh, sometimes a person is fortunate. He'll have a tremendous burden, but he'll have a good friend or he'll have a wife or a husband who, who is able to walk with them and to stay with them through the course of time and help them to bear that burden that they have. But over the years, I've had myriads of people who've walked into my office, who've called me on the telephone, who've asked me to go meet them somewhere where we could talk, maybe in a, a drugstore or a cafe or something of that nature and sit in a booth and they say, well, no one else will listen to me, Robert. I, I need someone to help me with the burden that's going on in my life. And I just don't know who to turn to. And I want you to keep this between you and me. And then they'll begin to pour out their heart, and sometimes once the floodgates open, they will pour out so very, very much, and you wonder, how in the world can that person endure what's going on in their life? Quite interestingly to me, the Scriptures approach this subject from several different perspectives, and as they approach this subject from these various and sundry pers perspectives, you and I hopefully will be able to gain a little bit of courage when we begin to think about how we're going to bear the burden that has come our way, whatever it might be. One of the most familiar passages in all of Scripture that talks about the burden is the statement of our Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. You'll know these words immediately. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light." There is a very perfectly outlined three-point sermon in this verse. We're going to cover it in just a few moments because we've got other territory to cover. But the first thing that Jesus says to us as his 
children, as his disciples, as the ones who are following after him, is that when it comes to burdens, we don't have to bear that burden all by ourselves. Now the truth of the matter is, I've discovered over the course of life that most times when someone looks at you in the face and, and, and says, is there something I could do for you? And you say, well, would you mind listening to me for a second? They'll say, as long as you don't take more than about 30 seconds, I've got something else to do. Most folks don't carry burdens for other people very often. But Jesus says, are you wearied out? Are you overwhelmed? Do you find yourself with some sort of difficulty or obstacle in your life that is causing you great pain and emotional turmoil? No one will listen to you. Come to me. And I can tell you this is the voice of experience speaking myriads of times in my life. It was because I had the avenue of prayer and it was because I had the listening ear of Jesus who's seated at the right hand of the throne of God and I believed that with all of my heart and with all of the confidence I could put in my life that I was able to find some relief because I could go to Jesus. And he says, when you come, I'll give you rest. When you come, I'm going to help you with the burden that you're struggling with. I'm going to, to help you to overcome with the obstacle, the, the, the difficulty that is there. I'll give you rest. But then the second thing that Jesus says in verse 29 is kind of interesting because he says we have to have a yoke we have to have a little bit of a burden or a challenge to function to our best capacity. The first time I ever came across this, I was listening to a psychologist by the name of Dr. Kerry Looney. Dr. Kerry Looney, the night before he spoke at the seminar in which he was sharing this stuff with us in, in Tyler, Texas, had spent the night at Granbury in the Nuthouse. And uh, so he made quite a lot of uh, to do about Dr. Kerry Looney signing the register at the Nut House in Granbury the night before. But then he got down to brass tacks. He got down to business. And he said, you know, if you look at this passage, there's a psychological principle that is very, very important here. And it's a very, very biblical principle. People don't function who don't have task. People don't function who don't have a significant something that's putting a yoke upon them to give them something to do. Have you ever noticed how many executives and other types retire and die within six months? Why does it happen? Well, sometimes it happens because they buy a motorcycle. I know of two instances in the last two years in which that transpired. But I'm convinced they were not prepared. They didn't have a mission. They didn't have a yoke to put about their neck that would give them a reason to get up in the morning and to get with it. Well, Jesus says, you come unto me, and when you come unto me, I'm going to take my yoke and put it on you. But what type of yoke are you going to put on me? Number three, Jesus, my yoke is easy. The burden that I'm going to ask you to carry is light. This word burden used in the New Testament is used mostly in the metaphorical sense. It's, it's an illustration more than it is a literal thing. When we talk about uh, burden and its definition, it usually means load. Uh, it is of a freight or lading of a ship. That's actually where the etymology of the word comes from. But in the metaphorical sense, it, it's talking about the fact that we have some burdensome rights. Uh, we have obligations. Uh, we have something that is either weighing us down or something that is propelling us. 
It can even be considered the faults of the conscience which oppress the soul. When I began to think about that, I began to think, well, what, what does the Bible say about us getting burdens? How, how do we get burdens? The biggest burden causer for mankind, but especially for those who claim Christ, is sin. The fact that we make a determination that we're going to do something that we know is wrong, it creates guilt. The guilt begins to put psychological and sometimes emotional and sometimes even physical pressure upon us. And we begin to wonder. We begin to wonder, what's causing me so much adversity right now? Frequently when a person will come in and we're going through the process, I'll say, well, how's your sin quotient? Huh? What do you mean? Are you doing something that you know is wrong, but you don't have the courage or you don't have the fortitude to give it up? You would be amazed at the number of people that once they really analyze that and, and, and come to conclusions say, oh, so that's kind of my problem. Listen to the psalmist, Psalm 38, verse 4. For my iniquities, my sins, are gone over my head. As a heavy burden, they weigh too much for me. My iniquities are compounding and causing difficulty. I'm so glad there's room at the cross for those of us who find ourselves walking in contrast to God's teaching through Christ. That when we turn in repentance, there is forgiveness. Some sins we may be involved in, we have to live with the consequences, but we can be free from the guilt, from the burden that's there. Sometimes burdens are caused because of love. Because we love someone or we love something, and when things are not harmonious in relationship, that begins to give us some difficulties. The Apostle Paul was struggling with this in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 4. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not so that you would be made sorrowful, but that you would know the love which I especially have for you. Paul says, I want you to know that, that, that these tears that I'm shedding, these emotions that I'm feeling, this, this burden that's upon me is there simply because I care about you. I care about you. Sometimes it's simply a passion for a person, or maybe it's a passion for a cause. Someone asked a young preacher one time, or the young preacher was asking the old preacher, let me get the story correct. He said, what, what's, what's given you the ability to continue to preach? And he says, because I can't do anything else. Oh, I could. I could build houses. I could do whatever I wanted to. But, but, but the preacher was saying to him, you've got to have a passion a passion for preaching. Every now and then, uh, we, we have a guest speaker and someone comes up to me and says, well, oh, Robert, isn't it so great? Uh, you've got a Sunday off? <laughs> you don't realize how I really want to laugh, you, laugh at you in the face and say, you're nuts. I've got 45 minutes worth of sermon already ready. I'm ready to preach. If you don't have that passion, you're not going to be much of a preacher. Some of you say, well, Robert, you need more passion. But that, maybe it wasn't. Listen to Paul as he talked about the way in which the Philippian brethren felt toward him. He said, nevertheless, you've done well to share with me in my affliction. Paul had difficulties, chapter 4, verse 14, to the church at Corinth. He says, in, in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. Talking about those Macedonians who were able to give so much for the poor saints in Jerusalem. Their burden was created because of passion, because of the feeling that they had for it. Sometimes it's just simply emotions that gets us into burdens. 
One of the greatest difficulties that we have sometimes is keeping our, our intellectual self and our emotional self balanced. It's a major challenge. Paul said to the church at Corinth, it was out of anguish of heart that I wrote you with many tears. And then sometimes burdens come up just because of life's challenges. It's the same sort of concept that we were talking about with stress last week. But those life challenges, uh, maybe it's illness, maybe it's a job, maybe it's, it's relationship problems that we're having. Uh, we have a friend that's mad at us or, or whatever the case might be. What are you going to do? How are you going to handle it? Paul was glad that they shared in his affliction. Well, I want to conclude or spend the last few minutes of the lesson talking about finding the help that we need to get our burdens carried. And the first thing I'll say to you is that the most important is to cast your care upon the Lord. He's the one that really understands. Listen to the psalmist again. Psalms 55 verse 22. Cast your burden upon the Lord. He will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. Now there's kind of a couple of keys there. He says he's not going to forsake you, but, but you really need to be righteous. You need to be walking in the right pathway. And when you're walking in the pathway of righteousness, that's when God is most concerned about your being delivered. You're being given the help that you need. Psalm 68, verse 19, Blessed be the Lord who daily bears our burden, the God who is our salvation. Beautiful concept. How often is God willing through Christ to, to sustain us, to hold us up when we're, we're dealing with that burden? He says it's daily. It's daily. Just like we are to deny ourselves and take up our cross daily, according to Luke 9, God daily is taking care of us. We need to allow Him and share with Him the burdens that we have. But you know the little story about the, the little boy who was sleeping upstairs in the house when the thunderstorm came is probably one that gives us a little bit of, of insight. You've probably heard the story. He hollers down to his dad. And he says, Dad, could you come up here? He says, this lightning and this thunder, this, it's scaring me to death. And the little boy shouts back down. He says, God, uh, Dad, he says, please, could you, could you just come up here and the father says, son, don't you know God is with you? Nothing's going to happen to you. God is with you. He's going to be helping you. Don't worry about a thing. Long silence, big clap of thunder. Little boy calls back down. And he says, daddy, he says, I know that God is with me up here, but I would appreciate it if I had someone with a little skin on to help me out. <laughs> we need others to help us share in carrying our burdens. We need people who will listen and who will not judge. People who will listen and who will not go and talk about everything that we've shared with them. People who will have our best interests at heart and will listen to us and when when we get to that point in time where we're beginning to unload on them, they will hold us up. They will sustain us. Romans chapter 15, I, I'd never looked at it in this light, but it's one of the verses that kept coming through my mind as I... I thought about us turning to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now we who are strong 
ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not to please ourselves. It's a biblical responsibility that God has given, that we, we, we develop relationships with one another in the church so that we can have someone to help us carry our burden. When I was taking some graduate counseling classes, one of the things that was recommended to us highly, especially if we did a lot of counseling and continually did clinical counseling, is that we would have someone who was our counselor. And so one young man in the class, uh, we were all graduate students, but this guy was a little younger than some of the rest of us, and he raised his hand, professor, and he says, do you have a counselor? And he says, I certainly do. I have someone that I go and talk to about what's going on in my heart, my emotions, my life, and in my clients' lives as we're trying to work through their problems and difficulties. I love the statement that my dad had in his wedding ceremony, had it in Sue and I ceremony. He says to the couple that you would lean upon each other throughout life. Beautiful picture that a husband and a wife are willing to help each other to bear the burdens as they go through the various difficulties and vicissitudes of life. The reality is we need one another and we need to develop friendships and relationships and we need to, to develop them that have such a level of confidentiality that we can share what's going on in our hearts. One of the things that has been uh, talked about an awful lot in the last 25 years in, in counseling circles is the idea of an accountability partner. Someone who helps you, someone you can open up to and you can tell those things that are, that are troubling you and difficult for you, those burdens that you have. We need one another. But there's a last point that I think we need to make. You and I as individuals need to ask ourselves the question, Am I willing to be a Christian donkey? Am I willing to become a person who my friends and associates in Christ and maybe my friends and associates in the world can come to and let me help them carry their burden? You see, that's why I think we need more Christian donkeys. We need more people who are willing to say, I'll take the load, and I'll carry that load for as long as I possibly can. And I'll help, I'll share, I'll strengthen. This whole lesson got started with this story that I read while I was looking for something totally totally different. Andrew Davidson tells of a life-changing lesson he learned from the great humanitarian theologian physician Dr. Albert Schweitzer. Dr. Albert Schweitzer was 85 years old when Andrew visited his jungle hospital at Lambarine on the banks of the Ogowi River. As Davidson says, it was about 11 o'clock in the morning. The equatorial sun was beating down mercilessly. We were walking up a hill with Dr. Schweitzer. Suddenly he left us, strode across the slope of the hill to a place where an African woman was struggling upward on the hill with a huge armload of wood for the cook fires. I watched with both admiration and concern as the 85-year-old man took the entire load of wood from the lady, carried it on up the hill for the relieved woman. When we all reached the top of the hill, one of the members of our group asked Dr. Schweitzer why he did things like that, implying that in that heat and at his age, he should not. 
Albert Schweitzer, looking right at all of us and pointing to the woman, said simply, No one should ever have to carry a burden like that alone. I know hundreds of people, literally. I can give you names who are carrying burdens alone and no one needs to carry the type of burden they're carrying by themselves. So, if we want others to help us to bear our burdens, maybe the admonition is for us to be willing to help them bear their burdens. Lesson is yours. I hope it'll be something that you'll think about, chew on, spend a lot of time contemplating, and let's all become Christian donkeys. Not the bad type, the good type. Not the ones born in the kickative mood, not the ones who, who never have a smile, the long faces, but those who carry the burdens of those who are around them, and do so with the greatest of integrity and the greatest of compassion. Maybe someone here who has a need spiritually, you need to be immersed into Jesus, raised to walk in newness of life. Maybe you need the prayers of the church. Maybe you've got a burden tonight and it's, it's being weighing down upon you. Let me tell you, you can, you can come and we'll pray and we'll share and we'll help. If there's anything we can do to assist you in the name of Christ, if you need to respond to his invitation, would you come while together we stand? While we sing. They shall be as white as snow, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow.